So authoritarian or authoritative, resolving the free speech tensions between secular and religious education, higher education. Empirical research we know that analyzes the lived experience of Muslims often shows a one-sided narrative about gender relations, intra and interfaith relations and societal relations. In seeking to reduce the impact of such discourse, I speak from a secular position, and also with understanding of, for example, the Islamic seminary, but with full awareness of the limitations of both of these epistemological approaches. It creates a binary. Accusations are often brought, brought against the reputed hegemony of such approaches by the other side, and this adversarial position creates an unfortunate and self-defeating binary. Antagonisms can be created between social conservatism and social liberalism, each exaggerated by the use of decontextualized argument. Today, I will look at practical examples of how the binary hegemony of religion as a block and secularism as a countervailing force can be challenged and both brought into conversation with each other. This whole situation, as we know, is exacerbated by current right wing populist debates around free speech. Freedom of expression is of, often presented in another counterproductive binary as either a libertarian right or an extreme risk. In order to break the hegemony of this secular device, it is necessary to consult Islamic thinkers and ethical experts such as Kamali and Raab and Al Fadl. Yet immediately we are faced with different approaches to free speech within modern Islamic thought. It may be argued, for example, that the seminary education of young men, young women is a necessary but not sufficient qualification for leading the British Muslim community. It may equally be argued that a secular education is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition to prepare young British citizens, whether they're Muslim or not, for adult life. There are many ways in which the situation could be improved for all parties. Authentic collaboration between universities and seminaries is happening to a certain extent, as we see in the case of Al Mahdi and Birmingham University, much to be praised. Yet safe and critical debate happens increasingly rarely, partly due to three phenomena. State managed initiatives such as Prevent, the counter terror agenda, the populist impulses described above, and thirdly, our inability to control social media and its competing platforms for truth. Kamali argues that discovering truth and upholding, hum upholding human dignity are the two fundamental goals of free speech, with truth trumping dignity in difficult times. Yet, the idea of truth remains to be debated honestly in multivocal societies like Britain and will doubtless provide competing truths. So I hope to demonstrate how the complementarity of fundamental truths can be achieved. My talk today is divided into three parts. First of all, looking at free speech on campus. All my work is looking at the university campus, but I think that's a microcosm of British life in many ways. So the first third of my talk, free speech. What do we know about free speech on campus? OK, um, an opinion poll in 2019 found that 52 percent of British adults believe that free speech is under threat in UK universities. Nearly a third of British adults believe that Islamic extremism, whatever that is, is common on campus. Muslims are placed at the heart of these debates about freedom of speech today, and they are regular targets of right wing populists who claim for themselves the mantle of defenders of freedom of speech. The idea that Muslims and Islam oppose freedom of speech is a core Orientalist trope long used by Western commentators to present the West by contrast, as the realm of the free. Critics of Islam bolster this claim by pointing to restrictions on speech in authoritarian Muslim majoritarian countries, and also to cases of global protest or even violence by Muslims reacting to literature or images deemed blasphemous. There are two strands of Islamic law related to freedom of speech. One which restricts certain social religious expressions to protect Islam as a faith, another which protects particular political expressions to make rulers accountable. As in all other religions, historically Islamic scholars saw freedom of speech as something that is both risky and to be upheld within limits. 
Jurists condemned blasphemy and particularly unrepentant apostasy, which was seen as tantamount to threatening the Muslim community. They advised more or less harsh penalties for religiously injurious speech, depending on their interpretation of scripture and depending on the context, as Rob shows us. But whilst prohibiting blasphemy, medieval Islamic states offered various levels of tolerance to certain religious minorities, to Jews, to Christians as people of the book, but also to Zoroastrians and for the Hanafi and Maliki legal schools, other groups like Hindus. To prevent strife in the political realm, medieval jurists required Muslims to obey their rules, rulers, even tyrannical ones, and they discouraged rebellion except in extreme circumstances. And this is common in Western thought, such as those of that of Spinoza and Kant. Nevertheless, they provided a certain level of legal protection for political dissent, for example, recommending constraints on rulers' ability to suppress rebels with a just cause. Now, some Islamic scholars today argue that freedom of speech is rooted deeply within Islamic law. Kamali recommends that a balance needs to be struck between modern commitments to democracy and to the classical Islamic legal tradition, which protected political dissent. In his book, Freedom of Expression in Islam, Kamali argues that Islamic law encourages freedom of speech as long as it is based upon affirmative evidence and is underpinned by freedom of belief for all within Islam. He uh, insists that the individual right to formulate and express opinions is guaranteed under Quranic principles. Such guarantees may not always be upheld. Khalid Abu al-Fadl, a contemporary Islamic legal scholar, offers a consideration of those authoritarian approaches, approaches to thinking and speaking that create Islam extremist trends socially and religiously and their implications for modern education. He critiques authoritarian approaches to Islamic law that can be found in some manifestations of Islam today. And he uses this analysis to explain totalitarian authoritarianism in Saudi Arabia. Against the backdrop of extremisms, both secular and religious, that curtail debate and assert the validity of only one interpretation, his work shows better alternatives. The importance of value of choice when interpreting religious texts, although some challenge his own lack of engagement with Hadith literature. As Slater shows, Abu al-Fadl uses what he calls strategic hesitancy to avoid the curtailment of discourse. Now, how can this discourse be realized and improved on campus? My Representing Islam on Campus AHRC project 2015 to 2018 re revealed that there is little teaching about Islam across much of the university sector. 66% of university modules on Islam and Muslims are taught at just 20 universities. A number of student and staff participants whom we interviewed called for more university curriculum coverage and interfaith programs that could provide a strong antidote to negative media and patriarchal discourses about Islam. Universities should work, as the feminist scholar Sabah Mahmoud argues, to improve understandings of Islam. The utopian model of progress must encourage the imagination rather than merely critiquing the ideologies we seek to topple. Open discussion is the first step. Democratic populism is the solution as advocated by Laclau, using populist reason, Mouffe using agonism, Schwalitz using deliberative democracy, and Abu El Fadl using Islamic pluralist community practice. Each can help to disrupt authoritarian posturing. We know, of course, that there is seldom concrete evidence that universities are sites of radicalization. I think there's no evidence at all. And the em emphasis placed on universities by the government to reform is now disproportionate. These facts also challenge the government's identification of university external speakers as posing a particular threat. This is a flawed assumption, considering the lack of evidence that attending one-off events with extreme speakers makes students more likely to commit terrorism. This is an extreme narrative, which I find uh, very obstructive and authoritarian without evidence. Now, I want to move to the middle, middle of my talk, um, which is to look at the ways in which life is being breathed into these debates by Shia students on campus. And the way into that is to look at charitable work. 
We see, for example, before we get on to the act actions of Shia students, the role played by the Charity Commission in discouraging open dis discussion about Islam. Charity Commission uses guidance which expands the range of views to be considered problematic from extremism, defined uh, in, the, in the government's way, uh, according to fundamental British values, to mere controversy. Now, this is an authoritarian approach. What is meant by controversy is unclear, and this is uh, this obstructs the possibility for young British Muslims to discuss their faith. My case study, the case study in my book, shows how this suppression operates in practice among students' unions. Charity Commission is willing to use a charity's purpose, the public benefit requirement, and it appeals to the charity's reputation to discourage charities from hosting speakers with views it considers to be controversial. Let us, by contrast, look at how Shia students use charitable activism on campus. This can show how the complementarity of fundamental truths can be achieved with authoritative, not authoritarian approaches to the common good. The charitable activities as a form of activism, that's a concept that currently worries the government a great deal. We are told that School children who demonstrate on behalf of Palestinians are extremism, are extremists, for example. Now, in 2019, Dr. Emmanuel Deli Esposti and I published a paper to summarize her work and my work on charity as both a religious and a secular activism. A number of Shi research participants in Deli Esposti's study highlighted the rise of Islamist terrorism post 9 11, and they noted the presence of Wahhabi and Salafi brands of Islam within Britain as a way to stress their alleged difference from those kinds of Muslims. So tension may exist in some situations about what it means to be a Muslim. It can create tension between Sunni and Shi. The Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, the 1991 Gulf War, the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq, and the recent conflicts in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. What does it mean to be a Sunni? What does it mean to be a Shia Islam, a Shia Muslim? Shi students may want to distance themselves from negative perceptions of Islam while emphasizing the elements of their religion that are perceived to be more comprehensible to a non-Muslim audience. Shi students are increasingly drawing on liberal humanitarian narratives of equality, freedom, justice and rights, a version of Shia Islam that resonates with the supposedly liberal secular environment of the university campus. Shiism can be framed as a fight for justice and thus Shia students contribute to the discursive construction of Islam as a force for social good. At the same time, this discourse can be used to distance Shiism from certain forms of Sunni Islam that are feared within the British social context. <clears throat> Shia Muslims remain in the minority in Europe, including with universities, within universities, yet the past decade shows a growing profile of Shiism on university campuses. Let us consider that authoritative Shia student activism may only have meaning within the context of contemporary Europe. And yet, I think these new narratives ultimately transcend national and cultural boundaries and contribute to a reinterpretation and reimagining of Shia sectarian identity for the modern age. Let's take an example, the annual Ashura Awareness Week. That's a campaign run by University APSOX, the Al Bayt Societies and coordinated by the Muslim Student Council, seeking to engage both Muslim and non-Muslim students in a conversation regarding the place and resonance of Shia Islam, and especially to raise awareness about the figure of Imam Hussein and the historical persecution of Shia Muslims. The Muslim Student Council also coordinates an annual nationwide campaign to reduce food poverty. It's called Hungry for Justice. Uh, in which ABSOX collect donations from students, Muslims and non-Muslims to distribute to local food banks. Individual ABSOX run one-off or small-scale events, often with other student societies, to raise awareness about current issues in Britain and internationally. For example, fundraising events for humanitarian aid to conflict-torn countries, Yemen and Syria, disaster zones like Haiti, the Philippines and Nepal, and awareness campaigns regarding issues of black and minority rights, femicide and racism. This provides opportunities to speak freely to non-Muslims about Shia Islam, and it empowers open conversations about personal identity. It can also give a strong sense of Shia particularism, and it is embedded also in the political and social realities of the modern secular state. Secularism exerts a controlling influence over public, 
private, political and religious issues and gives them a unifying set of properties that bind them to the state and privilege some faiths over others under the umbrella of secularism. We see this, as I described briefly before, with the Charity Commission's actions to, dis to deter discussion of matters relating to Islam. Activism takes place on campus and also, of course, among wider British society. There's, for example, the Imam Hussein blood donation campaign, which is a charitable project run by the UK-based Islamic Unity Society, a Shia-run charity affiliated to the Muslim Council of Britain and supported by the NHS. Here we see a sense of the value of self-sacrifice in a common and worthy cause. If we see this Shi activism in terms of secular ethics, we're missing the point, which is that Shi principles of service and community care resonate with, but are independent of, secular models of ethical practice. Yet, the Shi students we spoke to make strategic and good use of this resonance. Shi student activism has become consonant with public engagement with the secular state. The theolo Shi theology and ethical codes are in conversation with liberal humanitarian discourses of equality and make this opportunity for free speech. This allows Shi students on campus to contribute the distinctive Muslim voice that they may be denied in other activities, as we see with the authoritarian approach taken by the Charity Commission. So here we have a sense of Shi particularism and exceptionalism. This is often predicated on historical sense of victimhood dating back to the Battle of Karbala. And it has also been compounded by the very real experiences of marginalization, misunderstanding, and even active discrimination encountered by Shia students, sometimes at the hand of, hands of Sunni Muslims, not to mention the persecution of Shis in the Islamic world by Islamist and terrorist groups. For this reason, while the promotion of a distinctive Shi identity as qualitatively different from broader perception of Sunni Islam, can be understood partly as a strategic choice within the context in which it's articulated, there is also an important sense in which it actively contributes to a sectarianization, a special identity, a narrative about Shia identity through the act of discursively bracketing of Shiism as an identity category in its own right. This, you must be aware of the fact that I'm not using the term sectarianism as an insult. It's a, it is a sense of uniqueness unique destiny and a unique inheritance. Now, my third section, um, I want to reconfigure the free speech debate and the Muslim identity debate and show you how it can be framed into activism that goes right to the heart of our collective societal understanding of power and uses existing democratic structures to reach into the very corridors of power. Muslim, Christian, Jew and non-believer can work together to challenge existing power structures. And I'm going to give this to you very briefly as a little a miniature case study of ways in which we can look differently at our collective as well as our unique identity as British citizens by working on a common cause. This is on campus, but also off campus. In 2019, I set up um, a small research project called SOAS ICOP. ICOP stands for Influencing the Corridors of Power. My uh, aims were idealistic and rather large to improve political literacy among university students and academics, to encourage ideas about compromise so that one is able to have dealings with somebody whose political beliefs are different from one's own, to get into the corridors of power in Westminster with research undertaken by students and academics and to challenge the idea that a government with authoritarian tendencies and with a very large majority is untouchable. So this was my way of giving authority to young people by teaching them how to intervene legitimately in Westminster building in Westminster bus business not buildings. One of the ways we do this is to uh, issue one page briefings on urgent matters. They go to every MP and every peer. We've been able to influence the process of questions to ministers by working through MPs. If an MP works with an expert whom we locate to put together a question to the minister, the minister has to answer that within a week. And we've been able to influence, for example, the way in which faith uh, is used to 
gauge right at the beginning of the COVID crisis, how faith was used to gauge the many deaths that were taking place in the Muslim communities. We've been able to influence an early day motion on Myanmar when that blew up. And we've been able to influence the whole discussion about freedom of information. I found an article by an expert on freedom of information. Hassan, a member of the team, turned it into a one page briefing. The author of the original article was very happy to author it. Um, and this led to us working with high, high profile parliamentarians like David Davis and Lord Clark to run a panel to Im improve people's understanding of free freedom of information and the way in which the current government is obstructing our rights to free speech and free access and academic freedom. So that gives you, I hope, a very brief um, resume of my work. This is a practical outworking of my conviction that as well as working within religious communities, it is important to establish an identity beyond the religious community and to show that one has agency in ways that can actually trigger, activate and make positive use of the democratic structures which exist in this country, but which most of us don't know about. I, I certainly was not aware of how much influence we could have until we tried. So I think I will finish there. I think I'm just about running within time. And I hope that that will lead to some exciting questions when the time comes.